Hi everyone, and welcome into the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show that celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes. On today's episode, we wrap up the Jedi Academy trilogy. Young Kip Duran continues to seek revenge against the Empire, while Luke's students try to help their master defeat the ghost of an ancient Sith. It's Champions of the Force by Kevin J. Anderson, the third and final book in the Jedi Academy trilogy. And joining me to talk about the book, it's Dan. Welcome back, Dan. How are you today? I'm doing very well, Aaron. How are you? I'm good also. Are you excited for today's discussion? I, I'm stoked for today's discussion. I'm, I'm ready to dive right in. So your first time reading these books, we're not going to spoil anything for this book, but it sounds like this has been a really cool experience for you. Uh, definitely. Yeah. And, and thank you again for having me on. It's, it's been a pleasure. Um, I, a few of my buddies listened to the podcast, so it's been cool to get their feedback. Just get a text message after each episode like, Hey man, you did great. Uh, so again, thank you for having me. So now you're a celebrity. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Uh, but yeah, thank you for picking a, uh, a great trilogy for me to dive into and um, be a part of. Well, I'm really looking forward to talk about the book today and wrap up the series. But first, let's take a few listener questions. We have two emails today. The first is from Robin. Robin says, what do you think would happen in the story if Luke Skywalker was killed off early on? Like at the attack of the first Death Star blown up by his own father, frozen to death on Hoth, or killed by Jabba the Hutt. How would it affect the rest of the story? Would Darth Vader stay on the dark side for the rest of his life? Well, thank you for the email, Robin. It's an interesting what if. Dan, what do you think? How would the saga have changed if Luke had been killed before making it to the throne room on the second Death Star? Uh, yeah, it is a, uh, that's definitely an interesting what ifs. And I, I love playing what if games. Um, I may be misremembering, but in the second Force Unleashed uh, video game where you play as Starkiller, uh, Vader's secret apprentice, there is a scenario where you kill Luke Skywalker and it may be in one of the DLCs, but there is a, a cutscene with with a a lightsaber wielding Leia, um, and you have a boss battle with Leia. So, would that have happened? Would Obi Wan and Yoda have went to Leia immediately after? Luke's death and tried to spin her up on uh, powers that she has laying dormant. I that that'd be a good that is a good what if question. Would she have had the ability to bring Vader back to the dark side? I don't know. I I think maybe that was maybe that was only for Luke to do. Uh, so the total trajectory of the the story uh, kind of kind of hinges on him. So it would have been a very interesting story to to see play out without Luke in it. What about you, Aaron? What do you think? I think what you talk about is what would happen depending on when Luke died. If mm. Luke makes it through a new hope then I could see the rest of your scenario happening. Uh, If Luke is killed off in the events of The Empire Strikes Back or early on in Return of the Jedi, I could see Obi-Wan and Yoda reaching out to Leia to start to train her. Now, that would just push everything back a little bit. You know, it wouldn't end at the end of Return of the Jedi. Now we're talking another three or four years before she's able to confront Vader. If Luke is killed... At the Battle of Yavin in the first Death Star, then Leia gets killed too. 
because oh, the Death sure. Star was about to round the planet <laughs> and blow up Yavin 4. So if Luke is killed in that battle before blowing up the first Death Star, then for all intents and purposes in the saga that we know, the Empire wins. And I don't know how then the rebellion, the force itself rectifies the situation. It's fun to imagine because to me, stories are are more entertaining when the bad guys win and then trying to pick up the pieces, the heroes picking up the pieces of who's left because the, the best is gone. So who do we have left to try and take on this unstoppable force? And things just get more dire to the story. And maybe that's why for some fans, their favorite Star Wars movie is The Empire Strikes Back. Because that is ostensibly the movie where the Empire does win. Right. Thank you very much for the email, Robin. Dan, could you please read our next email? Absolutely. Today's second email comes from Raj, who says... I've heard a lot about Darth Malgus and Darth Malak, but I'm wondering how powerful they were at the the heights of their power. And a second question as well. In my opinion, Thrawn is a great character with his excellent tactical genius mind, his ability to assess every scenario before it happens, and his ability to predict the consequences of different situations. What exactly do you think about the tactical genius that is Grand Admiral Thrawn? Thank you very much for the email, Raj. I don't know how to categorize how powerful Darth Malak and Darth Malgus were back in the Old Republic time. But I can tell you what force abilities they normally generated and used and kind of the things they did. Darth Malak was a former Jedi trained in the Jedi arts along with Revan. Uh, He was a powerful lightsaber duelist. He was adept at using force lightning after he fell to the dark side. He could also use his screams to send out shock waves and destroy rocks and knock people down and destroy buildings and stuff like that. He eventually rose to become the Dark Lord of the Sith at his time. A while later, you have Darth Malgus. He was one of the ultimate Sith warriors. He always fought from the front lines of the Sith army. He killed his master, when he didn't think his master went far enough in wiping out the Jedi and the Jedi Temple on Coruscant back in the Old Republic times. He was known as the best lightsaber duelist in his day, and he was also pretty powerful when using Force Lightning. I hope this kind of answers your question, Raj. I don't really know how to put them on a scale of how powerful they were as opposed to other Sith. But uh, those are kind of the things that Darth Malak and Darth Malgus were known for. As to your second question, Grand Admiral Thrawn, I think he's a great character too. I really like the fact that you have this kind of different type of villain in Star Wars. To me, Thrawn is a villain, I believe some of his motivations are conflicted, which is why you have a lot of fans who will defend Thrawn as doing many of the things he does to help his people, the Chiss. That may be, but he still makes choices to help the Empire subjugate the galaxy. One thing that I think sometimes goes too far 
maybe some people think that you can never outwit Thrawn because of his tactical brilliance on the battlefield. I don't know of any military leader who got everything right all of the time. So I do think every once in a while it's nice to sprinkle in a couple times where Thrawn is outwitted. And if I had one criticism, I have more than one, but if I had one big criticism of the original Thrawn trilogy in Legends, I would have preferred Thrawn's defeat would have come by the New Republic outwitting Thrawn rather than something happening on Honegger and the Nogri turning against Thrawn without his knowledge. That's just for me. So, Dan, I know you don't know, know much about Darth's Malak or Malgus, but what are your opinions on Grand Admiral Thrawn? Yeah, as as far as Grand Admiral Thrawn, uh, I mean, I agree uh, with everything that you said. I think with characters that are insanely smart and uh, they can borderline predict the future, they tend to be at the mercy of uh, their writing. So how smart they are is dependent on who's writing them. And uh, even the characters that they're going up against, because those those heroes may have plot armor on their side. But yeah, I, I agree. As far as his defeat in the original trilogy, I would have liked to have seen him be outsmarted. As, as for uh, Darth Malgus and Malak, just my little knowledge on them, I think as far as power scaling... I think that the our canon characters that we have are kind of at the lower end of the power scale. If you were, I guess, ranking ranking by power, I mean, even as powerful as Luke was, like I, he wouldn't, I think, stand the chance against say like Revan or Malak or Malgus or probably even Bane. Maybe even Anakin would be on the lower end. When considering just the amount of like knowledge that has been lost throughout time with Knights of the Old Republic, like the, the Old Republic and I guess the High Republic. Is it that or is it they have to be pretty powerful because it's a video game? Oh, yeah, it could for sure be that, too. And they're also at the mercy of the writing, too. You don't want to have you don't want to be playing as or against weaker characters i've said it on this (laughs) podcast i've said it on another podcast one of the few things i think legends as a whole could have done better was depict the force more along the lines of how george lucas envisioned the way the force works i think sometimes in legends you have this power creep that comes in and it's more like superhero comic book stories. We have to find something strong enough to defeat Superman. We have to find something strong enough to defeat Thanos. So let's make someone with more powers. Um, And I don't think that's how Lucas ever envisioned the force. In order to win, you have to level up in the Force. Exactly. And unlock all of the character aspects. And there are times in Legends where I have compared Luke to Mario from Super Mario Brothers. When he needs to power up, he'll get a mushroom. He'll get the little (laughs) fire flower. I don't think he ever quite gets to the Infinity Star, but he gets close a few times. No, they they saved that for uh, for his nephew. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Thanks again for the emails, Robin and Raj. Now, listener, if you have a question for the show, you can email me at swlegendslounge at gmail.com. 
or send me a tweet at SW Legends Lounge. And if you'd like to get your voice on the show, you can record a short message and email it in. Just please record it in MP3 audio format. Coming up at the end of the show, we have an email from a listener with some thoughts about today's book. And we have two Star Wars character groupings to share. I can't wait to get to those. But now it's time for the book, Champions of the Force by Kevin J. Anderson, the third and final book in the Jedi Academy trilogy. Dan, are you ready? I'm ready, Aaron. Let's get it. Listener, grab yourself a drink. Let's head in to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. The story begins above the planet Corita, the home of the Imperial Academy. Kip Duron arrives in the Sun Crusher to take revenge for the Empire kidnapping his brother Zeth years ago. Kip demands to know what happened to his brother while Ambassador Fergan tries to stall, hoping to launch fighters and capture the Sun Crusher. But Kip sees through the ruse. He launches a resonance torpedo into Karita's sun, starting a chain reaction that will destroy the system. Fergan orders an evacuation, knowing most of the people on the planet are going to die. Of course, Fergan escapes and sets off for Anoth, the secret planet where Han and Leia's youngest son, Anakin, is kept hidden. The star explodes, just as Kip's brother, Zeth, speaks on the comm. He's alive. Frantically, Kip races down to the Imperial Academy in the Sun Crusher. He arrives just in time to save Zeth. But when his brother reaches up to Kip, another Imperial stabs him and tries to board the ship. Kip pushes the officer away and takes off, just as the star's radiation sweeps across the planet, annihilating it. On Yavin 4, Luke's body lies in state at the Great Temple but his spirit roams the halls, trying to get the attention of his students. Han and Leia arrive with Jason and Jaina, and the family hovers around Luke, hoping to find some way to help him wake up. But Exar Kun taunts Luke. The ancient Sith claims to be more powerful than anyone Luke has ever faced. The spirit possesses Streen and tries to destroy Luke's body but the other Academy students stop Streen and save their master. Han leaves Yavin 4 to search for Kip, hoping to stop the young man before he uses the Sun Crusher again. Han tracks Kip into the Galactic Core, where some of the last worlds loyal to the Empire are located. Consumed by grief over killing his brother, Kip refuses to listen. If he can destroy the last remnants of the Empire he can prevent other families from suffering the way his did. Kip powers up the Sun Crusher's remaining torpedoes, intending to launch them into the core. But that could destroy more than just the core worlds, Han says. It could cause a chain reaction that could affect the entire galaxy. Han moves the Falcon into the Sun Crusher's way. He tells Kip that if he's going to fire, the young man is going to have to go through him. At the Jedi Academy, little Jason wakes from a dream. Uncle Luke is in trouble. Jason wakes his sister Jaina, and the twins race to the temple auditorium. They arrive to find three dragons flying above their uncle's body. While Jaina tries to wake the others, Jason grabs Luke's lightsaber. Jaina arrives with Leia and the other students, and they find the little boy standing over Luke, swinging the green blade, protecting his uncle. Just then, a shadow emerges from the walls. It's Exar Kun. The Sith intends to use the students to break free from his prison in the temple. But Luke's students are strong. Together, they use the Force to push back against the shadow and destroy Exar Kun for good. With the Dark Man defeated, Luke opens his eyes and tells Jason, Jaina, and his students how proud he is of all of them. With Exar Kun defeated, Kip loses some of the anger that had an influence over him. 
he finally hears the warnings that Han has been trying to tell him. Deflated and defeated, Kip surrenders and agrees to return to Coruscant with Han to turn himself and the Sun Crusher over to the New Republic. While some on the Advisory Council want blood, most of them are more interested in keeping the superweapon in case another threat arises against the government. But Luke arrives and convinces the Council to get rid of the Sun Crusher once and for all by having Kip drop the ship into one of the black holes of the Maul Cluster. Speaking of the Maul, Chewie and Wedge are there with the New Republic Task Force trying to extract as much information from the facility as they can. But while the task force is looking through the installation, the remaining Imperial scientists and troop hide in the Death Star prototype, and they soon get it working. The Death Star fires on one of the asteroids that make up the installation, destroying it. Now, Wedge and Chewie can only watch in horror as the prototype makes the jump to light speed, and leaves the Maul Cluster. On Yavin 4, Admiral Akbar's former mechanic, Turpfin, arrives and tells Leia that Fergan knows about Anoth. When Leia asks what he's talking about, Turpfin admits to his role as an unwilling Imperial spy. Leia calls Akbar on Mon Cal to tell the Admiral what's happening. They meet at Anoth, just after Fergan arrives and grabs baby Anakin. The ambassador intends to elevate the baby into a new emperor, but only after the boy comes of age. Until then, Fergan intends to rule in his place. Fergan tries to flee with Anakin, but Turpfin surprises the ambassador and takes the baby back. Fergan then tries to escape in one of the Imperial walkers, but Turpfin also jumps into a walker and runs him down. Fergan dies when Turpfin pushes his walker over the edge of a cliff. It crashes to the ground and explodes. The Death Star prototype emerges from the Maul and goes into orbit above Kessel, where Lando Calrissian and Mara Jade are trying to set up Lando's new spice mining operation. The Death Star destroys Kessel's moon, but the ships of the Smuggler's Alliance are too small for the battle station to hit. The Smugglers start blasting away parts of the prototype's skeleton, forcing the Death Star to retreat and jump back into the Maul installation. After the Death Star returns, Luke and Kip arrive in the Shun Crusher. And out of nowhere, Admiral Dalla arrives in the Gorgon the last of her four Imperial Star Destroyers. A three-way battle ensues between Dalla, the Death Star, and the New Republic forces. Eventually, Kip uses the Sun Crusher as bait to tempt the Death Star to fly too close to one of the gravity wells, and both superweapons are sucked into a black hole. Kip manages to escape by squeezing himself into a message pod and shooting himself back toward the Maul installation. Wedge sets the installation to self-destruct, hoping to destroy the Gorgon, but Admiral Dalla orders the ship to jump out of the Maul just before the installation explodes. With the battle won, Leia returns to Coruscant with Han, Chewie, and Akbar to prepare for Mon Mothma's passing and funeral. But there's hope. Turpin says that Mon Mothma isn't dying from some unknown disease. Fergan infected her with microscopic nanodroids at their state meeting a few weeks ago. One of Luke's students, a gifted healer named Silgal, arrives to try and to help the chief of state. It takes nearly a full day, but Silgal uses the force to extract the nanodroids and save Mon Mothma's life. The story ends with Kip returning to Yavin 4 to continue his Jedi training, while Han, Leia, Akbar, and Mon Mothma travel to Vortex for the reopening of the Cathedral of Winds. Leia tells Mon Mothma how eager she is to see her mentor return to running the government, but Mon Mothma says she plans to retire. It's time to elect a new leader, 
and she believes that Leia will soon be the new chief of state. Time to take a break. When we return, Dan and I will talk more about Champions of the Force and the entire Jedi Academy series. I'm Aaron Motes. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. Thank you for listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge, where we celebrate the books from Star Wars Legends. But allow me to recommend a book from Star Wars canon. Catalyst, a Rogue One novel, is the story of Galen Erso, Orson Krennic, and the construction of the first Death Star. It's a story of intrigue, betrayal, and how a friendship can be destroyed. An essential story leading up to Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Check out Catalyst, a Rogue One novel, by James Lucino. Welcome back to the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show that celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes, and today, Dan and I are talking about Champions of the Force by Kevin J. Anderson, the third and final book in the Jedi Academy trilogy. Dan, when you were reading this book, early on, you told me that you really enjoyed one of the first scenes because of how cinematic you pictured it in your head with Kip firing the resonance torpedo, starting Karita's son on a chain reaction to explode, but then trying to save his brother from certain death. I think there's another really cinematic scene in this book, and that is, I can imagine Leia opening the door to the great, Temple Auditorium on Yavin 4 and seeing little two-year-old Jason standing above Luke's unconscious body on the beer, swinging a lightsaber with three dragons flying overhead. Did you also find this one as cinematic as I do? And what is it about the first scene that really hooked you at the start of this book? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Those, those two scenes in in this book really just the the way that they were, how detailed they were, how they were written. Like I was able to just paint that picture in in my mind. And going back to the first scene with Kip, the amount. I was I was frantic as I was reading through the story, um, which is how Kip was also feeling, and he was making rash decisions because he was so influenced by the by Exar Kun and the dark side, and those rash decisions ended up costing him his brother's life, and. He, he ended up destroying a whole, uh, the whole Karita system, uh, because of those rash decisions. But the just how frantic it was for him to abruptly send out the resonance torpedoes, and then hearing his brother's voice on the communicator and realizing how big of a mistake he made and then him calculating how much time he has left before the whole system blows and him just just trying to steamroll his way through all of the Imperials to get his brother only for him to come up short and lose his brother right in front of him. I think it was a chapter or might have been two chapters in a row. It, It just, I was on the edge of my seat reading it. And then, as far as Jason protecting Luke, I, I, uh, the only way I could visualize it was picturing one of uh, one of my twins when they were two doing it, and I just couldn't stop. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing at it, um, but laughing in a you, like I was enjoying the scene, just picturing. 
for me, I was picturing one of my two-year-olds uh, with a lightsaber being instructed in the ways of the Force by a Jedi Master uh, fighting three dragons. Um, I, I loved it. I love that whole that whole scene and just the the disbelief of the Jedi pupils and Jaina and Leia when they you know rush into the uh, when they rush into the auditorium and they just see a two year old flipping around and making very precise movements with a lightsaber. And just taking on those those three dragons, just their disbelief uh, was so fun to read through. Like you, I do think the first scene, one, it really sets the stage for what is going to happen in the book. I think that is perhaps in the entire series the best written part of the series for me. I would have to agree. And one thing I criticize Anderson's writing a lot, but one thing I do think he got right is how it shows when the dark side of the force is influencing you you can make decisions rashly based upon you not having all the facts of a situation and allowing your emotions to not be able to think clearly. It turns out that Kip originally thinks that when his brother was kidnapped, The Empire did something to him. The Empire lies to him and says that he died in a training exercise. But it turns out, in his quest for vengeance, he's really the one who causes his brother's death. He doesn't stab his brother. Obviously, that's another officer. But he sets the chain of events in motion that results in his brother's death. Definitely. And I I don't know with future Kip Duran stories if if he's impacted by those by that decision and like all the events that led up to his brother dying. Because ultimately he's gotta figure that he is the reason that his brother is dead. It's not the Empire. The Empire may have stolen those years away from him, but it it was Kip that ultimately killed his brother. Do future stories um, examine his mindset toward that? I don't remember future stories with Kip where he is ever thinking specifically about Zeth, but Kip is definitely affected by the events that take place while he is under the thrall of Exar Kun. Mm. He is definitely changed by the events of these books. That's good. At least they don't kind of sweep it under the rug. Right. I think one of the best things about this series is how... Anderson describes how both Kip and Gantoris earlier are affected by Exar Kun. You know, I said in the listener question segment how I think sometimes in Legends the Force is not depicted the way Lucas envisioned it. I think in this series the way Exar Kun uses the dark side to influence Kip and Gantoris and encourages them to use the dark side, I do think that is well written. I think that I think Anderson does a pretty good job with that. Definitely. And uh, I 
I will say that I liked the writing of Exar Kun. Um, I, I loved how he, uh, of all the characters, he tormented Streen, the one character that he is tormented by hearing voices all the time. And he's just, Exar Kun's right in his ear, you know, telling him to kill Luke or even tricking him into thinking that he's protecting Luke while nearly nearly killing him. And he comes close. He comes close oh, he, to killing him. He he does. He almost got him. Um but yes, I I loved how he was able to just twist visions of Gentorus and Kip and make he wasn't he wasn't forcing any hatred onto them he was able to show th- them visions and then influence just kind of direct them toward that that hatred uh yeah and i i really enjoyed um i really enjoyed how anderson wrote that he uses his words to seduce them into into some of the darker thoughts that they have by saying, look, I know you want this. I know you want to become more powerful. Gantoris, you want to become more powerful to help protect the people of Eol Shah. Kip, you want to become more powerful to get justice for your family, for what the Empire did to them. He uses his words to seduce them. And in that seduction, they fall for his tricks. Yeah, no one's ever seduced by the light side of the force, are they? No, a lot of the stuff that Yoda and (laughs) Obi-Wan says is kind of tedious and boring. It is by far the wiser decision if you sit there and think about it. But there's nothing enticing about talking about the light side of the force. Well, let's shift to some of the other events of this book. You have the storyline where Fergan is trying to kidnap Anakin to set up a new emperor. I think the main purpose of this storyline, honestly, is to show Terpfin breaking away breaking the influence that Fergan had over him as a spy for the empire. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know how long that plan would last, uh, trying to put a baby on the throne. Uh, as far as Turfin, I, I loved the, him processing his guilt of betraying Akbar and Leia and, the new Republic, I guess, as a whole. Um, and then him being able to redeem himself by, uh, killing Fergan and, uh, being free of that, that influence. He, he does get his hero moment in he rescuing does. Anakin and then, uh, hopping in one of the walkers and chasing Fergan down. Oh yeah. He, he guns him down. Well-deserved. So, two more things before we wrap up. One, and this is a criticism I have of Star Wars entirely, not just Legends, but Legends and Canon. Kip destroyed the Corita system. Kip destroyed that Cauldron Nebula. Kip has used this super weapon twice almost uses it a third time in the core worlds. And yet, when Luke says, oh, he was under the influence of the dark side, that's gone now, he needs to come back to the Jedi Academy, I will train him, I will take responsibility for him. Yes, he did these things against the Empire, But dude blew up some stars. 
there has to be some sort of retribution that Kip has to pay. I mean, there, in my opinion, there needs to be a trial. There needs to be some sort of recompense for Kip. Not just Luke saying, ah, let him come with me. I'll take care of him. Everything's okay. No, I, I, I'm in complete agreement with you. The the hand waving of the 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 Jedi hand waving of well he was he was under the influence. Um uh, would they would they have done the same thing if Vader had survived? If he had oh he 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 was under the influence of the emperor and he he was seduced by the dark side. It, he's okay now. I'll watch over him. Um, yeah, they they do it in the Dark Empire comics when Luke turns bad and he's brought back from the dark side. Yeah, I I think it's an issue that's kind of brushed over but I, I mean maybe you could look at it in a more menacing route uh, what are what's the new republic gonna do if Luke just bullies them and says hey Kip's okay we we had a we had a bit of a misunderstanding I, I mean I guess Luke could just bully the new republic into them just being like, okay, yeah, yeah, you, you know what? You're right. We maybe we shouldn't mess with you. Well, personally, I think that'd be a completely different character. I can't see Luke bullying anyone. I that to me would be um, writing a different character because that's not what Luke does. For sure, for sure. I, I, I I'm just thinking of the uh, it's always sunny. Uh, the implication joke, like, you know, I, I'm Luke Skywalker. Like, you you want to let Kip go, you know, for the implication of what would happen if you don't let Kip go. Last thing to talk about in this book, Silgao heals Mon Mothma. But after... Her recent public appearances, looking very weak, very frail, very sick. Some confidence amongst the other politicians, some confidence from the other planetary leaders has waned in Mon Mothma. She recognizes this. She believes, even though she's healed, some damage has been done to her public reputation and the last thing in the book she talks about a new chief of state and she thinks Leia is ready is that exciting for you do you think Leia is ready to become the chief of state of the new galactic republic honestly I couldn't care about politics <laughs> I do think that it's <laughs> the, the politics of Star Wars. I, I do think that it is a great contrast to the Empire where the, the Emperor would do literally anything he could to stay in power. Whereas when you have the Republic, a you have a, a great leader that is like, listen, I've lost... Um, I've lost some mojo. I've lost the the trust of the people. I can recognize that in order for us to continue having a strong republic, I need to set aside my my ego and my uh, my station and hopefully give it to somebody that can do just as good of a job, which I think Leia would do. Well, I honestly, have always enjoyed the politics of Star Wars as much as I criticize the prequel films. 
I was always interested in the political side of those films. I thought those were some of the more interesting parts. I think the politics in Legends is also pretty interesting. I still think one of my favorite characters in all of Legends is Borsk Falia. Originally seen in the Thrawn trilogy, we continue to see him throughout the timeline as an antagonist to Leia in the Senate. When I first read this, I was excited to see where the story went from here, particularly because Han already thinks Leia is taking on too much. You can't take on more than being the chief of state of the entire government. Yeah, once you get there, you've made it. Well, Dan, it's almost time to wrap up this episode. But before we do, I wanted to share an email from listener Colin, who has a pretty fun story about Champions of the Force. It was a very nice email, but it was a little long, so I had to edit it down a bit for the show. Here we go. Colin's email. He says, Champions of the Force was my first post-Return of the Jedi EU book, not the Thrawn trilogy, not even the first book of this trilogy. It was Champions of the Force. The book came out in late 1994. I was either 10 or 11 and browsing the local shops one evening when my family stopped in a small mom-and-pop bookstore where I discovered a group of Star Wars books on the shelves. I had already read the movie novelizations and Splinter of the Mind's Eye. But here were other books telling the story of what happened after Return of the Jedi. My mind was blown. With my small amount of pocket money, I had a decision to make. Which book do I get? I looked at the covers. I read the synopses. The Thrawn books sound like it's about some sort of military general. Snooze. But these other books have new Jedi, another Death Star, and an even more dangerous superweapon. Ultimately, I chose Champions of the Force because the cover had a group of Jedi standing on top of the Yavin Temple, holding aloft their lightsabers. This meant that I was going to get more lightsaber action. Man, was I confused. Not only was I coming in at the third act of a story, I had no prior knowledge of the other books. Luke is in a coma? Han and Leia have three kids. They keep talking about this Thrawn guy who's not even in these books. Where did this Mary Jade character come from? And Luke went to the dark side for a Palpatine clone? I was so out of my element, but I loved every page of it. Eventually, I got the other Jedi Academy books and borrowed the Thrawn books from my library to give me even more context. And from then on out, I was hooked into the EU. Thank you for keeping the EU joy and memories alive for some of us old-timers. Colin, what a fantastic story. Thank you for sharing it. Dan, can you imagine reading the final book of a series before anything else? I would be so confused. I would not understand anything of what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah, I, would, I would be so lost and like listening to the the email like 94 uh my parents uh their best friends had an antique store and i remember just that above the antique store was a um library and uh comic book room but i remember the amount of it, it was harder to find information about things back then <laughs> And trying to, um, like, no, if you're, if you're reading the middle of the story, the end of the story, uh, there was, what do you mean there was stuff that happened before this trilogy even came out? Uh, I, it happened to me all the way up until the prequel films. I didn't know that there were prequel films until I saw the, uh, glasses with Obi-Wan's face on the, uh, McDonald's glasses that you could get. I didn't even know there were prequels until then. So the 
living in a time before the age of information uh, was kind of exciting because you would stumble upon something and be like, oh, wow, now like I can, now I have to go back and dig up everything else, try and put all the pieces together. Colin, I think one of the things that helped you out is that you were either 10 or 11 years old. I think if you were a little older, you probably would have started the book, said, I do not know what's going on, and put it down. But because you were a Star Wars fan and you wanted to know why Luke was in this coma and what was going to happen, you kept reading. Thank you very much for sharing this story. What a great story. Dan, to wrap up today, we have a pair of Star Wars character groupings to share. We haven't done any of these in quite a while. They come from Caleb, who sent in a Starfighter squadron and a squad of ground troops. Caleb didn't name his fighter squadron, so we're going to call them Cobalt Squadron. Squadron leader and one flight leader, Cobalt 1, Wedge Antilles, X-Wing. Cobalt 2, Luke Skywalker, X-Wing. Cobalt 3, Biggs Darklighter, X-Wing. Cobalt 4, Han and Chewie in the Millennium Falcon, with Rex and Cody as gunners. Two Flight. Cobalt 5, Anakin Skywalker, N1 Starfighter. Cobalt 6, Jedi Master, Plo Koon, Jedi Starfighter. Cobalt 7, Master Yoda, Jedi Starfighter. And then Cobalt 8, Jango Fett, Slave 1. With 3 Flight, we've got Cobalt 9 with Lando Calrissian and Ni Num in the Lady Luck. Cobalt 10 with Gavin Darklighter in the X-Wing. Cobalt 11 with Boba Fett in the Slave 1. And then rounding it all out with Cobalt 12, you have Mando in the N1 Starfighter. Caleb's ground troops are led by Captain Rex. They consist of Delta Squad from the Republic Commando series. Jedi Bob from Lego Star Wars. The crew of the Tanta V4. Now... Caleb, I do have to ask, the crew of the Tanta V4 gets pretty much annihilated at the beginning of A New Hope. I'm not really sure you want those as part of your <laughs> ground troops, but whatever. These are these are your squadrons. And Jedi Bob will put them back together. That's, oh, that's sure. Why. Caleb includes the Rebel friends, I assume from the animated show Rebels. He didn't, he didn't specify. He just said the Rebel friends. And Star Killer himself, Galen Merrick. Thanks again for the character groupings, Caleb. Now, listener, if you have a Star Wars character grouping that you'd like to share with me, send me an email at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or send me a tweet at swlegendslounge. Or you can record yourself like Wes did in last episode and email it in but please record it in MP3 format. Well, Dan, it's time to go. Thank you very much for joining me today, and thank you so much for reading the Jedi Academy trilogy and talking about it with me over these last three episodes. Yes, thank you. Thank you again for having me. I know that you've been wanting to to get me on here for a while, and thank you for saving such a great trilogy for me to uh, really sink my teeth into and um, be a part of this experience. I really appreciate it. So, Dan, now that you've read the Jedi Academy trilogy and the Darth Bane trilogy, have these books whetted your appetite for more Legends stories? Unless I'm reading at work, I do not have time at home. I have twin three-year-old boys that just learned that they can climb the counters and reach the tops of the cabinets. So I am, I am on full-time 
wrangling duty when I get home. Sure. I think that's two different things. There's, are you able to read some, which at this point in time, you probably aren't able (laughs) to read outside of caring for your twins and doing your schoolwork. But the question is, would you like to read more? Not, are you able to read more? Uh, yeah, definitely. I would like to read more. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, you letting me borrow the uh, Jedi, uh, the Fall, Jedi Fallen Order book, and the Inquisitor book that you just finished. So I'm I'm excited to read through those. Two canon books. You're interested. Two in canon, canon books. That's nice. No, 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 no. Absolutely. Uh, you can. There are some very good canon stories. I really enjoyed that Inquisitor book. I think you'll probably get more out of the Battle Scars, the Jedi Fallen Order book, than I did. Since I didn't play the video games, um, I don't think the story resonated as much with me as it probably will with you. Yeah, it it just sounds like you need to uh, to just get a gaming system and... Get some Cal Kestis time in. I just don't like playing video games. It's something I've never enjoyed. The second one really dives into High Republic. I, I think that you could enjoy it. You should at least watch the cinematics on YouTube. I know I've been telling sure. you. But. I, I will do that. I will do that. Coming up on the next episode, I'm jumping back into my favorite era of the Star Wars timeline, the Rebellion era to tell the story of Han Solo rescuing a rebel spy and helping her track down a dangerous Imperial officer. It's Honor Among Thieves by James S.A. Corey. You can look forward to that episode coming out on August 9th. Thank you so much for listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge today. I'm Aaron Motes. May the Force be with you. And remember, there's always a bit of truth in Legends.